Hey, Rebel Bankers, this is your host, Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the Real Estate Money School. I've got an awesome episode for you, one that we've never done this topic. So all of you are going to love this. And I'm going to tell you who our guest is in just one second. But before we do that, let's talk about all of you and your journey to becoming a Rebel Banker. Your journey to becoming a Rebel Banker involves lots of knowledge. You're out there seeking knowledge, trying to figure it all out, but don't get caught up in the knowledge game when it's not about the knowledge, it's about the application of the knowledge you learn. So whatever you learn from today's episode, I want you to remember, it's what you apply is what's going to change things. And what Jen, our guest, is going to teach you is something you have to apply. So let's test your application skills. I'm going to give you something for free, but it's going to require you to take action. You can have one of my two books, The Private Money Guide or Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery for free. And all you need to do is go to chrisnoggle.com, swipe up, click on free book, and that is taking action. So I want to see how many of you rebel bankers can actually take that action. And if you can do that, you're going to get a lot out of this. So let's get right into this, Jen. So my guest today is Jen DePlessis, and Jen DePlessis has the title, and I love this. She's America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor, 37 years in the mortgage lending business. She no longer does that, but she teaches people how to do this and so much more. She's in real estate. She does a bunch with cash, wrap, sub twos, but we're going to get into all of that in a second. Jen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. I am so delighted to be here. I'm, um, so I'm excited. more yeah. delighted to have you here because <laughs> your story is awesome. Your energy is even better. And I can't oh, wait to bring you. this to my audience. So can we just start by just telling everybody a little bit about what you do? You're so dynamic. You do so many <laughs> things like just, okay. I, it's better that they hear it from you. I know. Well, I, I know. It, I, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible because there is so much that I do, but you know, it, and um, yeah, so we will be talking about all of that as we go through here, but yeah, you know, I mean, the crust of it, you've already said, is I had a 30 year, 37 year career in the mortgage business and the top 200 loan officers in the United States. So, uh, you know, big, massive business and, you know, in anything, and, and I, this goes, you know, true with you is the fact that you have uh, seven, you know, insurance policies, right? You, you use the product that you're working on, right? That you talk about. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do when I was in real estate or in mortgages was buy the product I was doing. And so that brought us into the real estate investing world and, you know, utilizing the skills that I had there. And then that, that actually moved into me podcasting because I have two podcasts, one you've been on success or uh, mortgage lending master. You've been on that one. Um, it's uh, seven and a half years. I've been doing that podcast. I'm one of the very first people doing podcasts. Um, and then I have the other podcast as well, which is really great success to significance. And, um, you know, and I just started saying, well, hey, you know, it wasn't enough just to have one revenue stream. I wanted multiple revenue streams. And you can tell by my personality, I don't like sitting still very long. Right? I like having movement. I'm, I would say I'm a pioneer, not a settler. So once I've pioneered it, I kind of leave stuff behind and move on to the next thing. And so now I coach loan officers, realtors, and real estate investors on priority management and lifestyle business mastery. So that's phenomenal. And you know, one of the things that I love is you have like a, a system. You have seven strategies to transforming your business mindset. Mindset is one of the biggest problems I see out there with whether they're entrepreneurs or just, you know, just the average person our mindsets are all messed up. We've been yeah. brought up our entire lives to literally focus on the wrong things. And it keeps yeah. us right where we're at. Like you have a system for that, the, the seven strategies. Like can we touch yeah. on a little bit of well, that? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the seven strategies, you know, and it's a gift I'm giving to everyone here. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a mind mapping. <laughs> You're going to love that word, right? <laughs> Do we have to put that I, helmet on with all the electrical connectors? I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a truly a mind mapper. I mean, I, my, look, my degree is in architectural design and construction engineering. I'm, I'm very linear, logical, right? I'm like the Spock thinker. And, you know, so I'm always mind mapping. And, uh, you know, so so for me, uh, you know, at least in my practice for many, many years, I was doing what everyone else says. And we're chasing the almighty dollar. And we're trying to climb ladders. and We're trying to close business. And, and then I realized that I didn't have the life that I wanted. And really that started from the mindset and changing and shifting my mind 
from for me, what became a life of proving into a life um, living my life, right? I just I was done proving and I wanted to start living. And it needed a mind shift change, you know, to say, who am I surrounding myself with? What are my core values? Who are my mentors? Are the mentors I have now the ones I need to have for the future? Are they the right ones right now? Um, You know, and again, the whole life of values, you know, I just I believe you can live your legacy while you're building it. I don't believe you have to build your legacy and then wait to live it and hope you have life left afterwards. Right. And so that's what the mindset, the seven strategies does is is it's a brainstorming for yourself to figure out what do you want? What do you want in your life? What fulfills you? And then build your business around that instead of the opposite way. That's awesome. 37 year career (laughs) in lending. I I just got to go here real quick because that's a long time to be in the lending business, but not just a long time. Like you have been through some of the worst economic disasters, the, the great recession in an industry that got hit the hardest. So can we just take the audience just back like, to when you were in the business and how did you evolve from that 37 year career yeah. into now being, you know, America's mortgage mastery mentor? How did that yeah. happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've been through seven, seven of these downturns, you know, in my career, um, seven of the downturns. And I would consider COVID to be a downturn at first, right? Because it, it was definitely a different shift for everybody. And my husband's still in the business. My daughter's a partner of his. She took my place when I left. Um, because I was the lead in that, you know, in our practice. Um, but, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I actually, the Great Recession was not as bad as the SNL bailout. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that I think was even people, worse. I think yeah, a lot and of maybe, people don't remember that. No, they don't. But maybe because I was younger at that time and it was something that affected me as a young person in the industry. You know, I wasn't always an originator. I was, um, you know, I was a manager. I was in management, underwriting, those types of things. I took the traditional woman path back then, you know, which was to be in operations. But, um, you know, when the Great Recession came, I... Uh, I, first of all, I was tickled that most of the loan officers who had gotten into the business just to make a buck were gone. So good riddance, be gone, because those that of us that have been in for a longer period of time have that resilience, you know, and have created this these beautiful businesses and, and practices that were sustainable. And they were just messing everything up. So good riddance, let them go. That was good. Um, But I spent a lot of time doing what I called emotional refinances because people would come in and it was funny. We had a box of tissue, a bottle of Pepto-Bismol and a bottle of wine sitting in in my desk. (laughs) I I said, pick your pick your vice here. Right. Because you're going to need one of them by the time we're done. Right. And so I'm, I'm really thankful because we only had two clients. And of course, when this happened, this happened before I became in the top 200. So um, the, and I was in the top 200 five times out of 785,000 loan officers. So it kind of tells you, you know, what that resilience is, but um, so this was before then. Right. But I was so thankful because we only had two clients that suffered during that one had a foreclosure and uh, because they were upside down and one had a short sale because they broke up. Um, but all of our clients survived it because we gathered them around and said, OK, you're not going to be able to refinance. You're upside down. You can't sell. You're upside down. So let's do an emotional refinance. And what we did is um, with the designation I have, I'm a certified mortgage planning specialist. It's the equivalent of a certified financial planner, a certified public accountant in mortgages. And um, so I, I'm all about that wealth creation and structure and how can I restructure. And so what we did is we just helped them reallocate their cash flow so that they could be in a position to be able to get out when they needed to get out. And it would be on their terms and not on the market terms. So that's really what we did. And so, so many people came in and said, can I pay you for your time? And I said, if I only could, it would be awesome. But we really just grabbed our clients and clients that we that's when I started something called Mortgages Under Management, where I'll adopt your mortgage if you've been orphaned by your last lender because they haven't shown up since closing. And people do that even today. So we have this adopt a mortgage program where we will be your guide. 
your guide through your entrance holding and exit strategy of your property. And um, we just really helped people. And you know, the fear and greed, right? Fear and greed charts and stuff. So many people were in fear. And of course, we didn't want to take them to greed, but we wanted to elevate that so that they were comfortable with the terms of what they had going on at that time. And and that really just helped propel our business forward um, by helping people understand what was going on. And we, of course, did that in COVID as well, because most people didn't understand what was happening. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've never heard, you know, there's a ton of mortgage brokers that I've worked with. And they do. As, as soon as you're like right at the closing, they're just gone. And, and yeah. you're, you know, I love that adoptive mortgage because, you, you know, you created something that hadn't been created yet. And that gave people that a lot of times people just need their hand held. That's the biggest purchase in most people's lives. And it's the one where the person on the other side, sometimes is just like, it's a transaction. Thank oh, you. Hey, yeah. yeah. Thanks. See thanks. See you later. You know, yeah. done. And like, there's yeah. just more to it than that. And you provided a service and that comfort that people really need. I love that. Yeah. Love well, we that. don't call them closings. We call them settlements because um, <laughs> every time I said a closing, so you always bring a gift to closing, you know, when we did that back then, you know, before um, CDs came out and stuff, but we went out uh, the closing disclosures, right? So I said, why would you go to a closing? It's like, bring a gift. And then we're going to close the casket on our relationship because that's exactly what they do. They, they sell rates quote, you know, they sell products quote rates, don't show up at closing, never to be heard from again. And I never ever wanted to be that type of an originator. And we never were even from the beginning. Um, we're all about the relationship and, you know, asset manager, you know, Bob manages somebody's asset. Chris manages my assets. No one even knows what your company name is. They don't know the insurance company that they're affiliated with. They just know Chris manages my money, right? And I said, well, who manages your loan? And people would say, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Dr. Co or Mr. Cooper, all those things. I said, no, no, no. They collect your payment. Who manages your mortgage? So I wanted them to go from, I don't care what company I was at. Jen manages my mortgage. Oh man, that's and my great. debt. So yeah. you're not in the business anymore, though, right? So somebody can't call you to get a mortgage anymore. But you've got a network of some some people that you coach and you know that you help through. So if yeah, like, I needed well, a I originate. Yeah, I do originate, but I don't originate traditional loans. So you just go to Bank of America, go to your local mortgage broker, or whatever Wells Fargo. You go to them to get your normal loan. But if you are looking at investment properties, because that was one of my niches. If you are doing investment properties and you're not eligible for a traditional loan, then you come to me because it's not just hard money, private money, but it's securitized money, multifamily, mixed use, everything, as long as it's non-owner occupied. And I'm not required to have a residential, I mean, a mortgage license to be able to do investment properties because they're not subject to QM. Well, the good news is, is everybody on here is an at investor. least in that sense. <laughs> they're all investors. Yeah, they're right? not. Well, let me back up. I want to make sure I get this clear. They're not subject to QM. They're subject to non-QM. These are non-QM loans. They're like non-qualifying mortgages, right? They don't qualify for a QM, so they're non-qualifying mortgages. And uh, but yeah, but so that's the deal. Is you know, and we do things with uh, five percent down investor. 10%, a 15% investor. So there's all kinds of reasons why people need to come to us. No income verification, no credit pulls on some. And so it's really, you know, all about being an investor. If you're a qualified investor, you know, there's an opportunity for you to buy whatever you want. Well, wow. you did say, I did, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I heard you correct. 5% down on investment properties? Yeah. Yeah, I have some know. investors who are willing, yeah, who are willing to do that with, with, and of course, there's no PMI that's not that world, right? This is totally different. They're willing to do that with the right experience, right? So don't think you're going to get it on your first or second deal. You do a few deals with us, and then all of a sudden we're going, hey, you know, now we don't require as much down. Um, and I would say the most common is uh, between 10 and 15%, I would say is the most common, and that's better than you can get in traditional financing. So if it's a cash flow issue um, and the numbers work, you know, and you can put keep that 5% in your pocket or in a wholesale, I mean, a whole life account. Hey, <laughs> right. Thanks for the plug. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I want to pivot a little here. We're in some crazy times right now. This is yeah. just strange. In my eyes, <laughs> as, you know, America's number one money mentor, I look around and I'm like, 
this crap going on out there, it just, it's scary. First it's off, scary. the government's printing crazy amounts of money. You know, it'll be $9 trillion before we know it. And all that money is going into these asset classes because it's it's not doing what people think. It's it's going to build these bubbles. And you're seeing real estate's out of control. I, I live in Buffalo, New York. I mean, you know that. This yeah. is yeah. a mecca for where people are just like, oh my God, I can't wait to live in Buffalo, New York. But you have like <laughs> six feet of snow in the winter. I'm sorry, there's not a lot of people that want that. And I'm mm-hmm. hearing of $240,000 houses going 80,000 over ask. Like yeah. something's not right. Like. Yeah. What is going on out there? How is it impacting the lending industry? Because I hear things keep changing in the lending industry. Like one day it's this, the next day it's that. Like, can you just shed some light on what you think is going on, what you think might be coming, and how is that impacting getting money for these investment properties? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not worried about the investment properties. I, I'm going to start with that one first. I'm not worried about the investment properties. Uh, you and I have actually had this conversation. We were talking about this not too long ago because you, I know you shed some properties. My son has shed some properties as well. Um, you know, and uh, and here I am buying. So what the heck, right? The difference is I'm buying really small foreclosures in in lot lump sums. I don't know any other way to say, but I'm in a buying club. And so we sort of, we get 15,000 properties a day, or I mean a week that we look at and we're saying, you know, should we buy these or should we not? And so the most recent one I just bought was about three weeks ago. I bought it in Thayer, Illinois, it's south of Springfield. Sight unseen other than Zillow and what they sent to me, right? I don't even know the condition in the house, but it doesn't matter to me because what how I'm posturing this First of all, I bought it for $9,400, three bedroom, or I'm sorry, two bedroom, two, one, two bedroom, one bath, (laughs) cute little house, beautiful neighborhood. I bought it for $9,400. I'm going to sell it for $58,000. The after repair value is like $125, something like that in this neighborhood. So I'm going to sell it for $58, but I'm not selling it to um, a renovation specialist or anything like that. I'm selling it to a family who wants to buy a house for two grand down, which they would have to do anyway, and pay rent mortgage payment of six sixty a month that is less than the going rents in the neighborhood, in the area, right? So I'm providing a service. I feel like you, you know, you learn, you earn, and then you re- you return, right? So I've already learned, I've earned, and now I want to give back. So I want these people to have the joy of home. It gives me goosies and I'm Jennifer, so I can do, I can say goosies like JLo. It gives me goosebumps because I want these people to be able to have the opportunity to buy a home. And if I can buy a home at a really cheap price like that, and I can become the owner and become the bank to them, then my goal is to get them to the point where they can make the payments. They can, you know, and I, I sort of qualify them. I do a little bit of qualification, but if they don't, if they don't make their payments, I can foreclose and do it all over again. Right. So I'm not buying and competing with the rest of the world who's out there. And there's tons of these out there and watch out they're coming because forbearance is going to end. And when it ends, everyone's going to go, oh, my God, I didn't know that I have to pay a $50,000 back payment. They didn't tell me. Oh, yeah, they did. Don't be like, that's like the Great Recession. No one told me I was going to have to, you know, I had a prepayment penalty and all this stuff. Um, So they're, they're out there. It's just, again, as an investor, it's one thing to say, well, this is how I invest. It's another thing to say, this is how I invest now. Next year, I might this. Two years, five years from now, I might do something totally different. I used to do a lot of subject twos. Now I'm not doing those because they can sell their house. The, the elevation of prices, right? They can sell their house and they have enough equity. But in cases where people had small equity and couldn't put it on the market with a realtor, that's where I would come in and buy subject two, take over the mortgage, wrap it, and resell it to someone else. And But that's not available now because everybody can sell. Like lickety split, everything everybody can sell. So I've shifted that, moved my money into a different, you know, reallocation. So that's that's what I feel about investing. It's it's going to even get better. It's just if you're going to try to compete with everybody else, that's going to be the challenge. Um, 
So that's one. Two is, yeah, it concerns me because this is looking a lot like the Great Recession, but for a different reason. We don't have the the same statistics that are around that we had back then. And we had higher unemployment. We now have lower unemployment. There's a lot of different things that are that are causing this. This is not. And by the way, if you look at charts, the inventory was through the roof. We had so much inventory um, and still, you know, we had this issue. We don't have the inventory now. So that that is definitely something that's changing. But I am concerned because here where I live, I live in the rich, well, I shouldn't say richest, the most wealthy county in the United States of America, right? We have the highest income level anywhere in the United States of America. And we're seeing three and four hundred thousand dollars above price. <laughs> right? We have, we are thinking about putting this house on the market. And I Airbnb this house, by the way, because everything I do, I try to make movement of money, right? So we Airbnb our house. We haven't made our mortgage payment in probably four years because the house does it, right? The Airbnb does. But we're thinking about putting our house on the market. It's probably worth 1.2. Our, our realtor is saying, hey, put it on for 1.4 and you'll probably get 1.6. Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. So we're saying, gosh, argue. should we sell now? But I'm not going to buy. I'm going to rent. Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably live in one of my investment properties, right? But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little concerned about what's going to happen uh, happen there. But hey, look, rates are low. If you can sell your house and make a ton of money on it, and you can buy another house higher price, even if it's higher price, if that's where you're at in your life, where you want to grow up instead of you know go down. Um, and you can do that at, you know, two and seven eighths and three and a quarter percent. It's it's free money. You know, it's literally free money. Uh, just know that you're going to be there forever. <laughs> right? yeah, that's, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people are like, oh, my God, it's so cheap. Yeah. But if the values go down, how long are you willing to stay there? Hopefully it's your forever home. You've got to be able to say, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. I mean, so you're going to be there forever. Yeah. yeah, me and my wife just bought a new home and we did buy, we kind of, we've been searching forever and we were looking to upgrade and we bought the cheapest house in the nicest neighborhood. Much like you, you know, in the Buffalo area, we bought a house in the, the most prestigious area. But the problem is, is those houses are all selling for crazy amounts. So we just found the ugliest duckling and then we're just going to renovate it. But I still think like when this all does happen, we're still, if we wanted to move, we're going to have a hard time selling it even at the Yeah, I think so day. too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, for example, you know, we were trying so the reason we wanted to sell the house is because we're it's just, we're on 21 acres. We're on a big, you know, beautiful home, but we want to sell. It's time to downsize and we want to go down to the lake. Well, last year at this time on the lake, there were probably 40 or 50 homes available. Right now, there's one house available on the water and it's 8.4 million. Mm. And that's not downsizing for us. No, <laughs> A big, that's a big upside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the challenge, and this is why the market is so, so tough is because if I sell, where am I going? Right. You know, rent. And I love that you said that a lot of people are like, oh my God, why would you sell a beautiful house to go rent? Well, I, I hate to say it because you're smart, but I mean, you're smart in how you're running your house now, your house, you know, everybody's house is a liability until they turn it into an asset. You have figured right, that out. You right. figured out how to be the bank a long time ago. And I want to go back to that example of that $9,000 house in just a second, because there's some crazy yeah. golden nuggets right there that we got to hit. But you know, yeah. with, with what you're doing now, your house is an asset because it's paying you. And you're yeah. living in it. You're living in a beautiful house, but yet your house pays you. Very few people yeah. ever figure out how to do that. So they, yeah. they you know, if they want to know how to do that, like we're going to get to how they can reach you, but let's just go back real quick to that $9,000 house. First off, <laughs> I didn't even know those existed. I live in Buffalo and there's parts here where back when I was buying a lot, nine through, let's just say 18, we, we could buy houses nine to 20,000, but you can't yeah. get those anymore. Those houses now are $80,000, but you're able to still find them because of this buyer's group. But I love not so much like folks, listen, like to make money in any investment, all you need to do is follow three simple steps. Number one, buy low. Jen just told you like, that's pretty low. Number two, sell high. And number three, you can't lose money. Because if you follow one and two, you're not going to lose money. That's what you're doing. Because no matter what, you bought a $9,000 house. I don't care if that house literally is ready to fall over. You didn't buy it for too much money. You just didn't. So, but then you take and you sell that house for 50 grand. But when you say sell, 
you're, it's just a paper sale to you, correct? You're still controlling yeah, the it asset. Is, yeah, I'm just holding the note. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you're controlling. I'm holding the note. Yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, what do they say? Own nothing, control everything. You're controlling it through yeah. the note. You're being the bank. Yeah. And then you're collecting checks every single month. Those checks aren't going to someone else's bank. They're going to the bank of Jen. And not yeah. only that, you're getting a down payment up front. So they're committed to that. And so what happens if these people, you know, that's a small down payment. You're providing home ownership to people that normally would have no chance of having home ownership. Correct. That's give back. But in all along, you're controlling every aspect. You're the bank collecting all the money. But what happens when they don't pay? Yeah, I foreclose and I do it all over again. Now, now the house is worth more. <laughs> right. The I rents have gone up. <laughs> right. I'm going to ask for a bigger down payment. I'll ask for more payments. Right. I think the I think the rate on. Well, I, I think the rate on this is eight percent. It's funny how we solve for this because we solve for payment on this. And, and then that determines what the rate and the term is going to be. So usually we're like at eight to 11 percent. And then that really solves the term. So this is going to be like a 10. I think it's a 10 or 11 year term. Um, which is really cool for someone too, that they don't have a 30 year mortgage. So it's all tied to what are the area rents and then let's reduce that and be more attractive that, hey, you can buy your own house for less than you pay for rent, hmm. right? And I don't care if there's mold in it and whatever, because these people will put sweat equity into it. I'm not gonna do any improvements whatsoever. It's sold as is. They put the improvements into it. They can't call me and say the plumbing's not working, this, that, and the other. You bought it. It's your house. Go for it. Oh, wow. That's so smart. And, you know, everybody listening to this, like, I hope you were taking notes right there because every one of you can duplicate that. You know, she's not dealing with the call on the toilets, the termites, none of that stuff. Like, it's your problem. You bought the house. She sold the house, but she controls the deal because she holds the note. How many of you right now are paying a payment to some uh, someone else's bank that you wish you were paying that payment back to yourself? It should be all yeah. of you. Our IRR on this, I, I think I have looked that one back up again. I believe it's 48% is our IRR. <laughs> like in 18 months, I'll have my money back. That's nuts. Right. In 18 months, I'll have my money back. Yeah. And it's so funny because the day that this happened, um, and I mean, I'm happy to be vulnerable about it, but, you know, I was preparing to go for, you know, work with you and do wholesale. And I was like, okay, when is this happening? And, you know, we're just waiting for someone to come and get all my blood work for my insurance policy. I'm living out here in the boonies and everything. And this deal came up and I'm like, oh God, do I do this? Do I do that? Which one do I do? And I finally said, you know, I'm, I'm pulling the trigger. I'm buying this crazy thing. The very next day, another deal came on for 21,000. I call my daughter and I go, hey, uh, do you want to go in on one with me? Because I just spent money yesterday, but another one just came in today. So we went in on that one at 21. So we're both invested at 20 something thousand or 10,000 each. And, um, and then, you know, when I was talking with Andrew, he's like, you know, hey, let's borrow that money back so you can go do it again. I'm like, yes, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm borrowing it from myself again. <laughs> you, had the, you had the process on how to do this and how, a proven process in real estate on how to be the bank. And all you did is like, after I came on your podcast, you're like, oh my gosh, I just have to change one thing. And how add fast can that. I get with you? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's exactly <laughs> it. Like, how fast can we talk? I'm like, well, real quick. And then you yeah. just added one step, which is this private bank that you now have. So now, instead of just making yeah. the money on holding the note, getting the payments, getting the down payment, now you're making money on uninterrupted compound interest. It's such a perfect yeah. strategy and it fits so well with what yeah. you did. Now, let me, that yeah. deal, like that whole layout of that deal, is that something you teach to your, you know, to your students and to the people that work with you? Yeah, uh, no, it is not because I'm not the expert. I'm not going out there as a real estate guru, right? There are many people like the, the different strategies, you know, buy and hold, flip, you know, flip houses, uh, tax liens, you know, there's all kinds of strategies out there. I don't teach those because I'm a student of those strategies. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't teach those, but what I teach investors, because what I hear so much, you know, I was part of RIA when I was a loan officer, you know, because that was my niche. And there's a lot of wannabe investors, you know, like I want to be, but they just don't pull the trigger. You mentioned it in the beginning, you know, about action, taking action. In fact, in my book, well, here, in my book, Launch, How to Take Your Business to New Heights, we actually wanted to call it Stop Talking, Take Action, Get Results, because it's so frustrating. You know what to do. You've been told, you've gone to the gurus, you've heard, heard, heard. You know what to do. 
just stop talking about it and take the action and get the results. And, you know, it was that way when I decided to Airbnb, I learned about it and I said, wait, I can Airbnb my own house. Boom. Three days later, I was Airbnb, right? It's, it's just who I am. You and I are talking about, you know, my, the book impact that you're a part of, you know, I, I thought about it within three days, I was under contract with a publisher and I was pulling all my authors together. Um, that's how those types of things really happen. And by the way, that led me to be able to do a TEDx talk, my second TEDx talk that I'll be doing in Ireland in November, because it took that action. So these opportunities are out there, but they don't come your way. You got to lean into it, right? So what I found with these wannabe investors was that um, they, you know, some guru is saying, look, you only need to dedicate an hour a day and you can be an investor. But when that hour came, they didn't know what to do. So I'm a strategist when it comes to you got an hour, let's work on purpose so you can go play with passion. We've got to work on purpose. So one of my specialties is priority management. I hate saying time blocking. I hate it. Because it's you could block time and say, I blocked it. It's not working. That's not it. It's priority management. And that really stems from these seven mindset strategies on how to time block properly, how to prioritize property so you get the results that you're looking for. Yeah, I think that's really smart. You know, I learned time blocking a long time ago, but you're right. You can time block all day long, but if that time blocking isn't putting the priorities first and priorities for most of you that are watching and listening, you know, it's what makes you the most money. So where are your priorities? Is it your family? Is it being with your kids? Is it, you know, the money making activities? Are you spending time blocking time slots and spending it on social media, just looking at photos? Like you got to understand, like, It doesn't matter how much you time block, you got to put priority to what is actually going to get you to your perfect day. And and correct. And and that's what the and that's what the seven strategies do is they get you thinking about, hey, what is important to me so that I can time block? I want can I tell two like two things? Oh my gosh. Stop eating soup with a fork. (laughs) That's really it, right? It, it's just a constant activities for the sake of activities. I should do it because I heard someone told me I should do it. Oh, there's another shiny object. I should do that too, right? And you come home and you're just not full and you're not fulfilled, right? And you think you worked and you're exhausted. And that's, this is what I teach to all of, for realtors and loan officers. I teach them how to grow their businesses too. But it, you know, obviously, because that's what I did. I mentor them, but, but if for the investor and all of them, it's about this priority management. The other thing I want to share with you and it's goofy story, but this is gonna. This is a sticky moment. This is a sticky moment. Whether you're a man or woman, I don't care. You've done laundry, right? But when we go to the dryer, we don't pull out a sock and run it to a bedroom and open up the drawer and put the sock in and come back and then go. Oh well, here's a towel. Fold the towel. Take it there. Come back and oh, here's a shirt. Take it back, right? And the reason we don't do that is because it's not efficient. What we do is we tend to take everything out and we fold it and we put it in compartmental piles. That's time blocking right? Because it's faster. If you can do the same type of activity over and over and over, you get to do that. You get to the point where you can do it faster. So when people say to me, how do you have all these businesses? How do you get all these things done? Well, I've learned to be really, really efficient. So that may not resonate with you. You're going, okay, whatever. But let me just share with you when you get your email. Hi, look at this puppy. Do you want a sponsor to this? Did you get my documentation? Can I talk to you about that? Come to this fun event. Here's another puppy again. Doctor appointment. You need to fill out this form. When it comes in, it's laundry. And when you go pecking through it all day, every day and get distracted from it, it robs you of that precious time that you could be moving your business and your life forward. So compartmentalizing even your email is what I'm talking about for priority. I mean, just everything, everything. But hopefully that gives you that stickiness to say, yeah, that that is kind of silly that we go through our email like that. Because it's just like doing laundry. It's stupid. I can use the same example of why do you have groceries in a bag? Why not just bring a can in and put it in a cabinet and bring the milk in and put it in the cabinet? But know, know that when you come in and you empty everything out of the bag, you tend to sort it on your counter so that you open the cabinet once, you open this once, but we don't do it in our business in our lives. And it drives me nuts. That's very true. Very true. I love that analogy of the bag because I think everybody listening, that's how you bring your groceries in. And then, I mean, how many of you actually take your groceries out and compartmentalize them on the counter and then put them all in their appropriate places? But you do that. with efficient. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But we don't do that with our business. We go to work. We work in our business, not on our business in most cases. Can't figure out where We're just going through just, you know, juggling the whole day. That's what most business owners I see are doing is juggling all day, every day in a state of panic and stress. 
eating soup with a fork. Yeah, exactly. But if they just started eating the soup with a big spoon, then you'd be getting a lot done. And you'd Bingo. Be, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great analogy. I love that. Um, you know, so we've covered a lot of really great <laughs> stuff. I mean, just unbelievable stuff. And there's a lot of people that could learn a lot from you. And, and you've got books and you've also got, you got all sorts of stuff. I mean, if you, I'm on your website now, you know, in podcasts, I have a TV show coming out. Yeah. Oh yeah. TV show. I, I don't, can you, you're going to be on it. I know. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the t- yeah. The TV show is called tell me I can't. Uh, because really my whole story is about, you know, I was, my nickname was Jenny who ain't got a penny and, and it meant something. Yeah. And it meant something, you know, I was told I was not going to be worth anything that I, you know, I would never have money. I'd be like my parents, you know, like all that stuff. And, and that was the drive that, that started that life of proving until I said, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to prove anymore. I want to live. And that's where I made that switch. And my volume went double. My volume went double, my time went less, and I was able to bring more things into my business because I said, there's got to be a way to crack this code, right? And so I cracked the code. And, you know, so for me, my whole life, I've been told you can't. You can't because you're too this, you're too that, you're whatever it is. And there's so many people in life that have been told that. And unfortunately, there's a handful of people, less than 5% of people that when you tell them they can't, they go watch out because here I go. But the remainder, they cave, right? And so what we want to do in this show, I mean, it's being produced by an Oscar Emmy award-winning producer and director. I've got really beautiful backing by Kevin Harrington, who's the original shark. He's part of this this um, this uh, network and everything. And, um, you know, that we want to explore, you know, when you were told, that moment you were told you can't, how did you feel and what did you do and where are you now, Right. So that we can share with people the various gifts that people have. My gift is different than the gift that propels you. And so we want people to realize, well, wait a minute, I have that gift. So next time someone tells them they can't, they're going to say, watch out, hear me roar. I love saying, tell me I can't. That's going to be fun. <laughs> right? So we're writing a book of the same name, Tell Me I Can. It's a fiction book. And we're actually positioning it to be uh, pitched to Hallmark as a Hallmark movie. And my ghostwriter for that book uh, wrote the on purpose or the purpose driven life. And he writes for Hallmark. So we're kind of going in a whole bunch of fun directions. Like I didn't have enough on my plate, but this is a big passion project for me. This is the sum of who I am and what I wanted to do in my return years. I love it. And, and you do have a lot going on, but you know what? You can handle it because yeah. you know how to, because you've created that system. You know, I hate now, now I'm always going to be reluctant to use the word time blocking. You know, uh-huh. you, I'm just going to start calling it priority block. Yeah. Priority, yeah management. priority management. Yeah. yeah. So I, I hate yeah. time blocking. I think you're right. Like, I mean, we can block all the time we want and then it's unproductive time. But if we actually put purpose behind that, and yeah. focus on priorities. Wow, what a novel idea. You know, some, some of the things in life, and I love like hearing it from someone else, some of the things in life that are the most valuable are the simplest things. That, you yeah. know, somehow we just never, we, we're always focused on the big thing, the hard thing, you know, and sometimes the answer is in the simplest little thing that nobody ever taught us how to do because there was no way for somebody to make money teaching us that. And yeah. that's kind of how I look at what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and you know, that's what I do with time. And it's what you do with money, right? It's, it's the same thing. Absolutely. It, it really is. So, well, I can't, I can't wait to go down this journey with you, you know, having the part in the book, being on the show and just everything else that's already on the podcast, but just continually just keep working together and, you know, helping you with your banking and becoming your own banker, which you're already doing. And we're just adding one step to put that perpetual tailwind behind your money. And I just yeah. think it's such an I'm awesome, so awesome yeah. journey. Yeah. Thank you. So thank for you. everybody watching, they're all on a journey too, Jen, and they need your help. So how do they find you? Yeah. Well, you know, we're all over, all of us are all over social media, right? So everything is Jen Duplessis, Jen Duplessis, but the best place is just go to jenduplessis.com and that you'll find everything that you need there. If you want to get the seven strategies, it's jenduplessis.com forward slash seven, the number seven strategies. And you can get that that um, complimentary PDF. It's just, you know, it's just a thought-provoking thing. Just make sure you take time for yourself. Go out in the woods. 
<laughs> or on your porch or at the beach, whatever you need to do to really take time for yourself to really say, gosh, you know, yeah, I need to, I need to change my thinking. Um, but yeah, just go there and you can, you know, there's an opportunity for you to connect with me. And I'm really, really good at responding to people because I'm here to serve and help. That's what my whole mission is in life. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. And I had that pinnacle moment where I changed. And now I know what it's, how beautiful it is on the other side as lightning as I am, as funny as I am. And I like moving around and fast and talking that I am, I'm very, very much of an introvert when it comes to taking care of me, both physically, spiritually, mentally, fam- you know, my relationships, my finances, just everything. I'm very much an introvert because I know where my priorities lie. I love it. So folks, we're going to put all those links for her website and you know, the seven steps, we're going to put that in there. You can just click on it or you just go in and just type it into Google. Google is an amazing thing. If you haven't heard about it now, you just, you put whatever you think the spelling is and it'll direct you right there. So give it a shot. Again, what was I talking about earlier? Taking action. There is so many golden nuggets that Jen just gave you on how you can take action all the way down to figure out those priorities and time block those priorities to you know, the real estate, the way she's doing that. If you didn't get excitement out of that, then there's something wrong with you, I think. And just all the other things. But you know, in the final question, Jen, I, I always like to kind of finish the show and the oh, episode boy. with one final question. And I've been listening to you the whole time thinking, what am I going to ask? And I got it. You just gave me that answer a second ago. On this journey, from being back to when people used to call you names to your massive success today, what has been your biggest external obstacle that you've had to overcome? My biggest external obstacle, um, imposter syndrome, that I wasn't good enough. Imposter. That I wasn't good enough. I, I consider that to be an internal, but I, I think it was an external for me as well. I, I didn't want to share what I knew because I didn't think any anything that I could share was going to be worth it to anybody else. And for me, um, and I know you said external, but but it, I think it's both because it stopped me. It stopped me prevent. You know what the deal is? We've been talking about action. I didn't take action. I didn't take action because I'm probably not going to make it. I'm probably going to fail. So I'm not going to take the action. So what did I do? I just consumed, consumed. And I was like this little um, squirrel that had all these nuts in its mouth. And all I was doing was drowning in my saliva because I had so much in there that wasn't going anywhere. And so I allowed people to say, well, this is your problem. This is what you need. This is what, you know, here's the solution for it. All these external people, instead of listening to me, listening to me. Wow. You know, there's something important in there. You know, there's a universal law. It's in a lot of books. And I know you talk about it, but you just mentioned it there. You were telling yourself you weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Anyone that tells himself, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. No one wants to hear this. You know what's going to happen? Exactly what you thought. Because once you change that mindset, you started thinking, I can, people will want to hear this. I can change people's lives. What happened, Jen? You did exactly. Well, the world became my oyster. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> it really so, did. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm glad I asked that question. I didn't know if that was going to be the most appropriate one. And I loved, I loved your answer, but I think everybody needs to really take that as another golden nugget for today, because that is such a huge piece to why people are not where they want to be. It's simply because they don't think they can be. And until you change your mindset and start thinking, I am and I can, not even I can, I will. Yeah. Nothing will change because thoughts, you know, I don't want to say this cliche thing, but you know, your thoughts are things. It's a universal law, but only if you think about them every day, focus on them every day, put them on your priority and work on them every day. And Jen, success is exactly related to that. So Jen, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much. Can you just tell everybody one more time where they can get that seven steps? Yeah, jenduplessis.com forward slash seven strategies. All right, folks. Well, you heard it right there. This was such an amazing episode. I can't wait for this one to skyrocket right to the highest downloaded and I know it will. And all of you are a major part of that. So let's go back to what I said earlier. You are all on a journey to becoming a rebel banker. And on that journey, you're getting knowledge. You just got a ton of knowledge, but now you need to figure out what you just learned here today and what one applies to your life and you need to take action on it. So go out there, check out Jen's website, get the seven steps, read her book, watch for her show, 
get my books. You see, there's so many different things, but you got to pick some of them. Let's just say two things out of what you just did or what you just heard to take action. Go out there, do it, and make the world your oyster. Folks, thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Real Estate Money School. Jen, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We'll see everybody on the next episode.